The Zelda series has produced masterpiece after masterpiece, but the one I've always held most dear to me is the Super NES game, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. It's a true classic and one of my absolute favorite games of all time. Which is why when 2013 Gerard heard about A Link Between Worlds, a follow-up that's part sequel, part homage, part whatever, I knew I had to play it immediately. I actually got to participate in some of the early marketing for this game, which led to me being able to make a video on the game on on launch day, tearing my way through it before anyone even had it, before it hit shelves, immediately declaring it my second favorite Zelda and a true successor to A Link to the Past. And yes, all of that was said in the heat of the moment at the peak of the hype, and I've had years to live with the game and revisit it and solidify how I feel. And you know what? I stand by every word of it, because I honestly cannot wait to recomplete The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds for the Nintendo 3DS. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another all new episode of The Completionist New Game Plus, where I am recompleting the first 120 games I ever featured here on the channel. And today, I'm going back to one of my very favorite Zelda games, which also holds a special place in this show's history. This was the very beginning of my relationship with Nintendo, and I managed to get the game a whole two weeks early, but couldn't say anything while I was under embargo, which also meant that I completed the game in a weird bubble, so there was some stuff that got missed, like the multiplayer Street Pass achievements and the endless Cuckoo Rush challenge that no one really knew about. But not this time. This time, I'm going to do it all. Because, you know, that's the whole name of the show, point of the show. That's why you're watching. So let's do it again, but better. Yeah. So when I first heard there was going to be a follow-up to A Link to the Past, I got really excited. That game is a masterpiece, and coming back to some of its concepts, like the ability to jump between, um, well, the dark world and the light world, seemed like a great idea to me. It wasn't clear at first whether it was a sequel, a remake, or something much weirder than that. But as it is usually the case with Zelda, it was something much weirder than that, in the best way possible. I absolutely loved A Link Between Worlds and gave it a rating of complete it. But it's important to note that I played it before I fully knew what completing it would entail. As a follow-up to one of my favorite games of all time though, I was more than satisfied. A Link Between Worlds takes place in the same locales as A Link to the Past, which is known as Triforce of Gods in Japan. It's got many of the same locations, but it's set way later in the timeline. It's got a whole new set of dungeons. I loved that the concept of jumping between two worlds is still here. And to make it a little bit more of a direct sequel, the version of Ganon you face off against is the same one from the previous game. Plus, in Japan, the game is literally called Triforce of Gods 2, so, you know, there's that. But it's important that the game also stands out and stakes its own place in the Zelda series, which I think it absolutely did, knowing when to borrow from the previous game and when to inject new ideas. In place of A Link to the Past's Light World and Dark World, A Link Between Worlds bounces between Hyrule and its mirror world of Low Rule, because everyone loves some pun-based name shenanigans. The story kicks off when a mysterious weirdo named Yuga, who looks suspiciously like a art hipster version of Ganon, turns the seven sages into paintings as part of an evil plot to revive Ganon and fuse with him. Bad guys are always trying to fuse with things, man. It's like, you gotta learn to love yourself before you can fuse with an ancient evil entity, dude. Link ends up chasing Yuga into low rule, which is like high rule, but technically lower. It's dark and twisted, and things there have not been going great. But with the help of Zelda's low rule counterpart, Hilda, and a mysterious man in a bunny suit named Ravio, Link's got to rescue the sages, restore the Triforce, and save not one, but two kingdoms from Ganon and Yuga. But thanks to Ravio, Link has access to a cool new bracelet that lets him traverse the two worlds, as well as turn into a painting himself whenever his little hero heart desires. Going two-dimensional and traversing along a wall felt super cool and got me thinking about the space in new fun ways. And the addition of the third dimension makes sense on a system called the Nintendo 3DS. And it's cool seeing the classic typical top-down Zelda view turned on its side. The puzzles and challenges in A Link Between Worlds end up feeling really unique to this particular game, even 
as a direct follow-up to another game. The other thing that really sets apart Link Between Worlds from the other game is its approach to items. Most of the staple items like the bow, hookshot, and boomerang are all here, but instead of getting them from dungeons like in the good old days, they can be rented out from Ravio at his shop and are returned to him if you die. It makes managing your rupees way more important, and it felt like a totally different approach to a staple of the Zelda series. As much as the idea of renting your items sounds kind of annoying, I was shocked last time at how well it works and you can purchase them eventually, which honestly felt pretty rewarding every time. It also fits in with what's meant to be the game's biggest gimmick, which is the ability to complete the dungeons in any order. Of course, I love finding ways to break the order of games, especially in Zelda games. So it wasn't a huge selling point for me last time, especially since between now and then, there's been a massive surge in the Link to the Past randomizer scene. But it's still neat, and a lot of other cool design ideas like the rental system emerged from that approach of choosing Choose your own adventure. So I've got a pretty good idea of what to expect from my replay through A Link Between Worlds, unlike the first time when I literally knew nothing about it. But the one thing that does worry me a little bit is the Cuckoo Rush, which has a prize for surviving 999 seconds against an onslaught of RNG-based chickens. I don't know if it was a thing when I first played the game, because frankly it sounds impossible, but I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> you all... You all heard that, right? So in the world of movies, relaunching a franchise with a belated sequel always seems a little desperate. Although movies like Creed or Fury Road show that it can be done. And in my opinion, A Link Between Worlds remains the perfect example of how to do this with a game. It's kind of a sequel, kind of a reimagining, and absolutely its own thing, while still having strong ties to the history of the series. Of course, every game in a long-standing series like Zelda needs to find a way to stand apart. But when you specifically tie a new game to A Link to the Past, Past, you're creating a certain set of expectations. Yet, A Link Between Worlds knows it's not enough to just coast on the qualities of a previous game, even though it totally could. I went into it the first time thinking I knew what to expect, but I had a ton of surprises waiting for me. For instance, it was brilliant to take the Dark World concept and make it even more specific on both a gameplay level and a lore level. Low Rule still feels like a cool new version of a pretty well-worn concept. The idea of a mirror world that's a dark reflection of the regular world wasn't new in 2013 when A Link Between Worlds came out, and it wasn't even new when A Link to the Past came out. But the fact that they decided to add so much detail is what impressed me when I first played the game and impressed me again this time around. So for example, even though the overworld is basically the exact same as before, all of the dungeons are new, and the freedom to play them in any order made this feel like an explorer's dream. Now, in the years since, we've had Breath of the Wild, which took this ethos of exploration all the way to the freaking moon, but that doesn't take away away from what A Link Between Worlds accomplished. I remember how I was impressed by the balance and exploration too, given that it's set in the same locales as Link to the Past. Sometimes I was rewarded for my familiarity with the old game, finding collectibles like heart pieces just where I knew they would be. And sometimes I was thrown totally off guard by the ways the worlds of Hyrule and Lowrule had changed over the course of thousands of years. The world is familiar but surprising, and at the same time, that's true of the game's story. Yeah, Ganon is up to his usual shenanigans, but this time we've also got the low rule equivalent of Ganon, Yuga. Same for Zelda and Link's counterparts. It's fun to encounter new versions of these classic characters, especially because they would often surprise me with the ways they were different. So a little quick spoiler warning coming at you right now. When I first played Link Between Worlds, I was totally caught off guard by the twist that Hilda was playing everyone the whole time, just so she could restore Low Rule to its former glory. Now Zelda would never do that. And then there's Ravio, who turns out to be the Low Rule version of Link in a bunny mask, who runs away from his fate. That's weird as hell, and it definitely sets him apart from Link. Essentially, A Link Between Worlds borrows the skeleton from A Link to the Past, but adds all sorts of new skin, and organs, and that's a creepier analogy than I wanted it to be, but I still stand by it. And none of that even touches on the biggest new gameplay element, the ability to turn into an adorable drawing of Link and move along walls. Again, it's very weird and specific, and it works. The stylized way that 2D Link is drawn, the way that you have to start rethinking the space, it all blew my mind back in 2013. And while I knew what to expect this time around, it was no less enjoyable. In fact, I had a great time being able to jump straight into hero mode this time around. Everything does four times as much damage, but it's all 
all still very doable. I remember normal mode being super easy, so getting to start out with hero mode this time around was exactly what I wanted from the game. The dungeons are still really short and quick, but they require a lot more care when everything hurts that much more. A Link Between Worlds could have easily just been A Link to the Past again, and people still would have eaten it up. Hell, I know I would have, but getting to revisit the joys of that game while also getting a brand new Zelda experience, that's way more in the spirit of what these games are. The best Zelda installments take risks, with their links to the past always balanced by a link to the future of the series. Not to mention that the music is even better than I remember. And while time has not been super kind to every 3DS game, a Link Between Worlds honestly looks great. I would personally love to see a Switch version, but playing it again on the 3DS was a pleasure. Revisiting this game is like revisiting a link to the past. You know they're true masterpieces because they keep getting better over time. And now that the game has been out for a while and I'm not playing it in a vacuum, I actually get to approach it with the knowledge of what it takes to complete the game instead of just hoping I got everything. And I was just as pleased with this game's approach to completion as I was last time. All of the completion challenges are linked to your progression in the game, pun intended. However, there is one major exception. <laughs> All right, hold on, we'll get to the chickens, I promise. But everything else in A Link Between Worlds is a joy to complete, from the dungeons, to the minigames, to the treacherous tower, with floor after floor of combat challenges. Obviously, there are many hard pieces to collect because this is a Zelda game after all. And in hero mode, I definitely want to prioritize having those. Speaking of prioritizing items, I still have to find the game's other big collectible all over again. That's right, the impossible to pronounce Maya Mayas. My Mayas? My, my Maya. Right now on screen, it hurts my brain to read it. Ocarina had the Skultolas, Link's Awakening had the Secret Seashells, and Link Between Worlds has a truly insane number of snail squid hybrid babies for Link to find in both Hyrule and Low Rule. Their mom gives you a map that will help a little bit, and you can hear them squeaking when you get close to them. But these little guys are everywhere. It's a full-on infestation. But collecting all of those adorable crustaceans is actually helpful. Every 10 that you collect, you'd get to upgrade one of the items you own. And when you would upgrade one of these items that you'd have, the upgraded versions are genuinely so useful. The fire rod, for instance, becomes a weapon of mass destruction. It is so much fire, you guys. And it's great to get a reward that isn't, here is some heart pieces or rupees. The completion aspect of finding all of the collectibles actually pushed me forward through the game, and it was even cooler when I was playing it for the first time, and I had no idea how cool all of my items would eventually be. So this time, I prioritized saving up to purchase the items so I could upgrade them as soon as I could. Although honestly, renting them might have been the more financially responsible thing to do since I didn't die too much. Oh well, gotta spend rupees to make rupees, I guess. Now there's also the treacherous tower with waves of enemies to fight through. The advanced mode has 50 floors, and you get a second prize for doing it again. But it honestly wasn't a chore. The rest of the game is easy enough that these combat scenarios are simply a fun challenge, especially on hero mode, where I really had to play cautiously. I remember the feel of last time, like it took a little while, but Honestly, I didn't mind it this time around. Now, new to my playthrough here are the multiplayer Street Pass achievements, which I couldn't do last time, because you know, it's kind of hard to do that when nobody else had the game yet. But thankfully, that's not an issue anymore, and I have plenty of friends who are used to me forcing them to help me complete games with multiplayer. Now, in order to do this, I needed several 3DSs and several copies of A Link Between Worlds. So, I went to my Patreon, and I asked my Discord to help out. So, thank you guys so much for your support. Without you, I couldn't have done this. Once you've collected every single Street Pass medal, you'll have the ability to fight the old man who's in charge of the Street Pass challenges. This fight is pretty tough, but honestly, it's kind of fun. It's a test of all of your skill crammed into one fight you can get access to whenever you'd like. Overall, A Link Between Worlds was exactly as delightful of a process to complete as I remember it being the first time around. Just to joy to finish for the second time. Except... That's right, it's finally time for me to talk about the Cuckoo Rush Challenge, in which Link bravely sits in a pen that is being swarmed by thousands of cuckoos, ducking and weaving between feathered murder machines, a maelstrom of beaks and claws for as long as he's able to withstand it. So when I first played through Link Between Worlds, I thought this was just another silly, fun minigame. But I was foolish, 
and naive, because what turned out to be a secret was something I missed completely. I didn't know it at the time, but in addition to the rewards for surviving the tornado of pissed off chickens in each of the difficulty levels, there was also prizes for the endless mode, with their player earning rupees for surviving 100 seconds, 300 seconds, 500 seconds, and so on. However, it turns out that there is a prize for lasting 999 seconds, which, little math for you guys, that's just over 15 minutes. And everyone, let me tell you, I'm actually glad I didn't know about it the first time around. I was in a glorious haze of playing through this masterpiece early, and if I had known about this challenge, it may have intruded my honeymoon phase with this game. Because, let me just cut the bullshit, guys. It's hard. It's so freaking hard. The only way that I could physically do this was to one, take breaks, and two, pause the game to buffer and plan my moves if I even wanted the chance to survive. And even at that, it's 15 minutes. 15 minutes is such a long time. It may not feel like it when you're binging through shows on Netflix, but 15 minutes in the eye of a chicken storm is something a man never forgets. And it's a bummer because completing everything else is so fun and chill and it all builds to one stellar experience. And maybe this is my fault for wishing parts of the game were a little bit harder because I do, but not like this. For the love of God, not like this. I spent more time fleeing from cuckoos than I did playing the rest of the motherfucking game. And this playthrough has honestly been a bit chicken poisoned. I still love this game, but playing through without knowing about the cuckoo rush was such blissful ignorance. I did it. I did it eventually. But at what cost, I ask you? At what cost? Oof, okay. Getting all of the upgraded items is an awesome reward for finding all of the Maya Mais. But A Link Between Worlds does not stop there. Once you've found every single one of them, you will get an enhanced spin attack move that takes up over half the screen. It's very cool, and it saved my life more than once. Having all of the hard pieces, the fully upgraded weapons, and super spin attack really made me feel like a badass. Like I had been rewarded for my efforts. It's exactly what a completion reward should be. But I wish I could say the same for the freaking Cuckoo Rush. It's easily the hardest thing to do and the reward is a giant chicken who can restore your health one at a time with a single kiss cool obviously that's not exactly worth the backbreaking effort that it takes to survive the cuckoos for 999 seconds fortunately every other aspect of the game rewards you handsomely for completing it but i can't help but be bummed that the cuckoo rush ends up just feeling like a big waste of time at the very least i am super excited that this gigantic big ass chicken is in the credits because i made it appear there that i did that that's for me. It's in the credits because I fucking did the challenge. Fuck this game. This game is gorgeous and pretty easy and worth doing everything else though. As a sequel to A Link to the Past, it lives up to one of the best games ever. And as its own installment of the Zelda franchise, it adds all sorts of new fun ideas. And this time, I can honestly say, it's not just the hype of playing it pre-release that makes it one of my favorite Zelda games. But the real shame about those chickens though, they just legitimately broke me. When I re-completed The Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds, there were eight deaths, which is a few less than last time. Jumping straight into hero mode definitely made the early levels a little more treacherous, but once I started getting the items and heart pieces, I became an unkillable force of goodness. 100 Maya Maya's rescued, which was easier now that I wasn't playing the game totally blind. And this time, I tried to get them all as soon as I could because I knew I wanted that super dope spin attack. 28 heart pieces collected, most of which I still remembered the location of from the first time around. 29 total hours of playtime, which is more than last time, even though I only had to play through it once. Those chickens ate up 13 hours of my life that I am never getting back. And a grand total of two worlds. I mean, come on, it's right there in the title. So. There you guys have it. Recompleting A Link Between Worlds was in some ways a totally different experience from last time, and in some ways the exact same experience. Because as a game, it's exactly as solid as I remember, and earns its spot as my second favorite Zelda game. 
It looks and sounds amazing. It hits just enough of the Link to the Past nostalgia buttons while also doing its own thing. And the story puts all kinds of fun twists on the standard light world, dark world scenarios. It's a true masterpiece and that my friends has not changed. But playing the game under the embargo at the peak of the hype and playing it now years later definitely feels different. In some ways it's great because all the info about the game is out there now, which makes completing it a lot easier. But I also long for the days when I didn't know that I had to survive a stupid cuckoo challenge for over 999 seconds. So it's hard. It's honestly the only thing in this game that I'm not a huge fan of. Everything else is worth it, but those damn chickens all deserve to be fried, eaten, and put in barbecue sauce as far as I'm concerned. So, with that in mind guys, I eat this game its new completionist rating of Finish It. Finish It! That's all time for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like the show, hit the like button. Be sure to subscribe. And if you want to support us, head over to patreon.com slash the completionist. Guys, I've been Gerard the Completionist, and I'll see you next week for another brand new episode. Bye-bye.